Hello everyone, my name is Tracy Siska. I'm executive director and founder of the Chicago Justice Project. I'm here uh, to present about the Justice Media Project, which is our internal name for it, but also the breakout group is Quantified Justice News. I founded CJP a little over 11 years ago to basically force open data from justice agencies local here in the Chicago community, which basically means um, our 911 center office emergency management and communications, Chicago Police Department, Cook County State's Attorney, Cook County Courts, Cook County Sheriff, uh, Public Defender's Office if we get to it, and then I'll think of other ones. Yeah. Okay. What is the Justice Media Project? So we started um, a little over seven years ago, and basically we started by scraping the Tribune and uh, Sun-Times website to collect uh, media content on crime, violence, and justice reporting. Now we're up to about 30, a little over 30 sources, including some of the um, blogs, the police union blog, a bunch of others. We now, during that time, we've had about over 100 volunteers, some with law firms, some with academic institutions, go through and categorize now a little over 35,000 or maybe close to 40,000 articles by a criteria we set up, which is the image here to the left. Uh, if anyone wants more info about the categories, I'm happy to go into it after we are done presenting. All right, the need, this is why it's important. Like everything else in our society, reporting on these issues is, rep is impacted by race and class of who's being covered and who the victims are. Why? Bias reporting, this is the big thing. Bias reporting leads to bias social and justice policy. Basically, what gets reported gets prioritized in the reforms. If what you're trying to reform in the criminal justice system isn't making the press, and you're not able to put a fire under it, you're not going to be able to be able to work in that space. It's very hard. Okay, so we started scraping in 11. In 2013, we had had a complete year of scraping. We did a study on violence against women reporting. And this number should scare people who are worried about that issue. What we uncovered in that year of reporting was that the Trib and Sun-Times, both on the website, like all the content on the website and in their paper, of all the sexual assault stories, which were 205 between both sources, 96% were on stranger attacks. Men jumping out of bushes, breaking into homes, and attacking women. And while those are awful, and I don't want to say they're not, it's horrible, it's exactly opposite of how they occur in society. Women should, right, the 75 to 90 percent of the attacks are by men the women know. It's almost, you know, mostly women, but when you look at it, it's almost always men they know when they get assaulted. So they're protecting themselves when they're worried about walking to the car or in a parking lot, when the reality is most likely to be assaulted, it's going to be from someone they know. Okay, and I got one other stat before I pass it on to the data guys. When you look at Chicago media, of course we see all, you're bombed in social media, bombed in regular media about shootings. And I, obviously, we don't want anyone to be shot. We don't want any shooting. But here's a little context, right, that you don't see in the mainstream press. Calls for service. I guessed around 20,000 related to calls. At that point, it would have to be just about seven calls per incident. And it probably isn't that many, but I guessed at that, OK? Official reports, this is in 2017. Official reports, 2,785 shootings. Of course, we want that number down. But here's a little context. Domestic calls for service calling 911 related to domestic incidents 200,000 a year okay domestic those domestic reports the official reports are domestic violence those are domestic battery reports that is when a, someone calls 911 which by the way one out of three incidents is reported to the police that is when someone is a victim is called 911 a police officer showed up and he's actually taken the time to write a report that's 60,000 you don't hear about those. Those don't make the press. We geospace, we analyzed the geospatial disparity of um, sexual assault and domestic violence reporting over that year. Basically, Whiteville, the loop to Kedzie North, had no reporting. White men don't beat their women. If you, if you read the Tribune at Sun Times, that's what you would think. Almost all the offenders were black. In all the case, black or brown, in all the cases were hyperviolent. Exactly opposite of how all this stuff happens. So that's why this is important. That's why we came, we brought this project to a hack night for two things. We wanted to take the volunteers' categoriz categorization and turn it into machine learning so that computers could code. And we wanted to be able to 
extract geo strings and be able to geotag the articles. So I'm going to give you over to the group and Josh to start to talk about the data side. Hi, I'm Josh. Uh, you might have seen me before try and summarize all of that into two seconds uh, when I implore you to join our group. Uh, but so Tracy described that this project was originally done by hand, by people manually tagging which uh, each article as a type of crime and a geographic location. However, there's this really cool technique called machine learning that's a field of uh, computer science and sort of statistics as well, where we can use computers to do that for us. Uh, machine learning is something you've probably done. When you uh, do a regression and fit a line to a bunch of data in Excel, that's machine learning. You're teaching the computer to predict uh, the Y value of a new X data point from your old data. Uh, however, you can also do this with um, much more complex algorithms and do much more complex tasks like uh, image classification, like this is a dog or this is a cat, or even things like uh, language translation, translating something uh, into whatever language you want. Uh, what we want to do with this data is the two things I described, is identifying what type of crime the, uh, the article is about and where it happened. So we're going to do that with two different models. The first thing we want to do is the, the type of crime. The model that ended up uh, being best for this is representing each article as a bag of words, which means just a vector of the count of each word that appears in the article. We don't care about the uh, order of the words or the sequence or anything like that. And then it just a simple logistic regression on top of that. Uh, for location, it gets a little more difficult because the first thing we have to do is identify which part of the article is talking about the location. And that's sort of like a, a geostring, right? Something like 5500 West Block of uh, Woodlawn Avenue or something like that. And so to extract that, we're going to use something called a recurrent neural network, which are really great for sequence uh, processing, like things like uh, translation or identifying a certain uh, phrase. Uh, and then we're going to pass that to a web service called a geocoder, which is going to take 5500 West Block of Woodlawn Avenue and give us back the latitude and longitude of that spot. And Kevin's going to tell you why machine learning. Thanks, Josh. Um, yeah, so. I think Josh did a good, do good job of describing kind of what machine learning is and what we're using it for. But I think a question that is just as important as asking, you know, what machine learning algorithm do I want to use, what do I want to do, is why should I use machine learning? It's not obvious necessarily that, that it should be used. Um, there's a lot of reasons not to use machine learning. It can reinforce the bias in your data set. You know, if you have a bunch of biased labels, if you train a classifier on that, you're going to get a, a bunch of biased results. Um, so it's not necessarily obvious that we should use it, so why? And there's really only one answer to that, and that there's, there's too much data. Um, so this is a plot of how many articles have been scraped. Um, you got the, the year on the x-axis there and the number of articles scraped on the, on the y-axis there. So we can see that as of, I think, I don't know, a few weeks ago, I don't remember when I downloaded the data last, we're very quickly approaching 500,000. That's almost half a million. Um, getting humans to go through and say, this article is about homicide. This article is about burglary. Uh, that would be much more time and money than I think Tracy has. Uh, so we need machine learning. It's, it's kind of that simple. All right, so enough about that. I, I think a lot of people here are probably interested in the data. Um, I think we can stand up here and talk about how we did it all, the, all we want, but people like seeing data, so let's get right into it. Just kidding. I want to do some caveats first, <laughs> because showing data like this is always, you know, should be done with, with great caution, right? Um, so I want to get through some list of caveats here. So bear with me. We'll get to the data. I promise I'm not you know, doing the slides real quick behind, behind my back. So the caveats, right? So the following data represents a small part of the total database. Um, so if I flip back a couple of slides, you see we almost have 500,000 news articles. Um, trying to run these machine learning models on my laptop would take until about next month. So I didn't have time to do everything. Um, so we're just seeing kind of a small part of the total database. Uh, as you do this with more data, more things, the conclusions you draw become a little bit more you can be more confident in those conclusions, and this is a small part of it, and I want to be aware of that. 
Um, we're also going to see all the news outlets at once. So I think Tracy talked about how with the uh, initial investigation they did, they looked at the Tribune and Sun-Times. Uh, since that time, we've added a, quite a few more news outlets to the scraping process, and we're not doing any filtering at all. So it's just all the news outlets, you know, the Trib and Sun-Times, but also a lot of smaller reports as well. Um, the geolocation results have not been thoroughly vetted. So as, as Josh said, we relied on a third-party service to do the actual, you know, taking that 5500 South Woodlawn Avenue and getting that into a latitude longitude. We used a third-party service for that, and the results are what they are. They haven't been thoroughly vetted, but they're probably, probably pretty good. Um, and lastly, we haven't dealt with articles that have multiple locations, right? There's a, you know, news articles are not only about one thing. Sometimes they can be about multiple crimes in multiple different locations. And thinking about how you actually want to normalize with that kind of thing is important. So that's enough of that. All right. So in short, treat the following as preliminary results. Please don't say these are firm conclusions by any means. All right. A map. Very exciting. So what do we have here? We have burglary reporting. So this is a heat map where the brighter values indicate more reporting about burglaries. So this is all news articles from 2015 that we scraped that have been classified as about burglary by the machine learning algorithm. And we've used the other machine learning algorithm to extract the geostrings, things like 5500 South uh, Woodlawn Avenue. And then we've passed those off to the geocoder and said, hey, what are the lat longs of this? And then we use that to just create this heat map. So again, the brighter values here indicate more reporting. So we can see geographically, it looks like there's some hot spots a little bit on the north side. Um, might be hard to see the exact details, but it's not super important. The, the important thing here is just getting a general idea of what this looks like. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna compare that to the burglary incidents. This is from the City of Chicago data portal. There's the crimes database, which I think is the most downloaded that it has. Uh, I don't know why, I can't imagine. But, um, you know, we can download that data set and actually do the same thing. We can plot all burglary incidents that occurred in the year 2015 according to that, um, that spreadsheet, essentially. And what do we see? We see this kind of geographic distribution. Let me flip back to the previous one and go forward again. Does anyone see any differences? <laughs> okay, so now bear with me because this part is the part that might be a little hard to follow. What I'm going to do, my next magic trick, is I'm going to take this one and I'm going to subtract this one from that so what do we think when we, you know, what does that actually mean, right? That means that I'm going to see where is there more proportional reporting about burglaries compared to the actual burglary incidents. Um, so the color code here is basically green is over-reporting, purple is under-reporting. So green means that there are more news articles proportionally about burglaries than there actually are burglaries in that place. Um, so let's get a real concrete example because that's that might be hard to follow. Let's get a concrete example. So we have two examples here. We have Lakeview, neighborhood of Lakeview, um, was the most overreported. So what do I mean by that? Lakeview had, according to that crimes database that I downloaded from the data portal, had 2.26% of burglaries. So take all the burglaries in Chicago, Lakeview had 2.26% of the burglaries in the city of Chicago in the year 2015. It had 6.64% of news articles. So I think, I forget the exact number there, but Essentially, we're seeing that 6.64% of news articles written about burglaries were written about the burglaries in Lakeview, right? So that's about three times as much. Uh, on the other side, the most underreported is the neighborhood of South Shore, uh, which had 5.65% of the burglaries in the year 2015 and had 0.33% of news articles. I do remember the exact number for that. It was one. There was one news article about a burglary in South Shore. Um, yeah, so this is the kind of thing that we want to do. We want to break this out into all the different kinds of crimes, all the different, um, you know, maybe break it up into the different news outlets. You can see how does the Tribune look? What does the Sun-Times look like? What do these different outlets look like? There's a lot of ways to slice this data, and this is only a very small portion of it. Um, so again, I want us all to be aware of that, but this is kind of hopefully an interesting look at what it seems like we're, we're seeing, right? These are, are patterns that are starting to emerge um, and I think as we look at different crimes, different, um, you know, all the different ways to slice the data, like I said, I think we'll see some, see some interesting conclusions. Uh, so that, that's it for the data side of my, Matt or Michael? Matt? Uh, hey, I'm Matt. Um, I did a lot of the stuff uh, sort of keeping the scrapers running. Um, I'm not actually going to talk too much about that. It's not all that interesting. Um, 
But uh, I did want to talk just a little bit about the mechanics of the breakout group, sort of challenges, what we've learned uh, from doing a sort of more like in-depth technical project um, in a chi as a chi hack night breakout group. And maybe that would be useful for other folks who are running breakout groups. Um, so we started in, I guess, um, in earnest, probably beginning of 2017. I think a uh, few of us were, you know, met a couple times before that, but I um, think that's sort of when the, the commits started ramping up. Um, we had, um, we sort of had like unofficial owners or like specializations. So, um, so Kevin and Josh were mainly working on the, the data side of things that they were talking about. Uh, and then Michael and I were, um, did a lot of the web side and the scraping side of things. So um, just sort of having like point people for the different aspects of a project um, was, was kind of nice or it was easy to like, if, when someone came and was like interested in data science or interested in, you know, in Django, we could like, you know, there was one person, the, there were like, you know, a smaller set of people for them to be talking to. Um, so yeah, there were four to six regular contributors uh, and then, a, you know, other folks who sort of came in and out. Um, but it was, a, I think, a probably more insular breakout group than others, um, uh, just as far as like the, the number of people who were on for the whole time. Um, and I think most of the development actually happened outside of breakout group time. So we used the breakout groups to sort of talk about the project with, uh, with new, new folks who just wanted to learn about it, um, sort of touching base um, beyond what we could do in Slack. Um, and then some, uh, yeah, some collaboration or just um, sort of context sharing. Um, but I think with, you know, with a project like this, I think at least I found it was a little bit difficult to like really get focused and be super productive in like an hour and a half or two hours in the cafeteria back there. Um, so that was just, I guess, you know, maybe obvious, maybe not, and maybe works differently for other groups, but I, I thought that was a little bit interesting. Um, so, and then just a couple other things that we learned. Um, I think um, for the website, I didn't do a particularly good job of having an onboarding strategy for newcomers. Um, so, you know, that could be a cont contributions document, um, sort of just documentation on getting, you know, getting everything up and running locally. Um, we sort of had some idea of like what we could use, you know, more casual volunteers for what, you know, a small contribution might look like, but we didn't really like, um, you know, think too much about like, what is like a small task that, you know, someone who knows a little bit of uh, Python or a little bit of um, you know, something else might be able to do. Uh, so we didn't really have like tasks like that queued up and ready to go. Um, and so that also I think meant we couldn't really like you know, say, that, you know, this is, you know, if you know these sorts of things, this, you know, we could, you know, we couldn't like pitch to other potential volunteers what they might, you know, be working on. Um, and then we also, like, I think what we did do a little bit of a better job is, is like larger chunks of work. Um, so I think like once, you know, the, you know, four or so of us uh, started working together, we sort of did a good job of like, um, you, know, man, you know, managing the project among ourselves, like, oh, this, you know, this is sort of the next thing we're going to do. We're going to, you know, um, you know, try a new, um, you know, a new model for the geotagging or um, something on the website. So I think we had, a, we did a little bit of a better job of splitting up bigger tasks, but not as much for the, for the onboarding side of things. And then at a certain point, I think maybe a month or two ago, we sort of just stopped um, recruiting con contributors. Josh, you still came up and, you know, pitched the project and, you know, we still talked about it to people who were interested. But I think we realized, like, you know, we, we sort of know what we're doing. We have an end goal. We want to, like, finish this one model and get the data set sort of cleaned up. Um, and we just wanted to like get to that point and not really be distracted by, um, you know, onboarding new folks. Um, and I think that, I personally, I think that's okay. I think it was a little, like, I felt a little bit bad about it sometimes, like, you know, we're just working. But um, I think, you know, especially when you're getting toward the end of a project, it's, you know, you know what you need to get done. Um, so that's, I think, that's about it. I don't know if any of you guys have other thoughts. Cool. Uh, can I just ask a clarifi clarifying question? Um, so were you concerned with reports of incidents or unique incidents or number of reports per unique incident also? So like for one crime, you might have like Tribune and then Sometimes and a bunch of other outlets picking okay. up the same thing. So no, we don't. Right now, we're not worried about unique incidents. So we're just worried about the bulk reporting. Cool. Um, real quick, if we ever, Kevin had this idea, and it, well, I don't think we ever got it to go, but if we can then maybe we'll take another run at it at some point, matching 
the articles to crime incident data on a, in some kind of automated fashion that might come into there. Uh, thanks for doing this. This is really interesting. Um, I just had a question. Uh, when you look across the different sources of news, are you able to get any insights as to which outlets seem to be maybe more balanced, for lack of a better word? We haven't done an in-depth look. I will say I'm a criminologist. I work on my PhD in criminology. Um, the thought is just TV news is worse than print. <laughs> so I, we, we haven't taken an in-depth look, um, but none of them seem that much better than the other. Uh, thank you for this great presentation, all of you all, and the work that you put into this. Uh, the question I have is, are some, are like the Sunta or Tribune, um, are they aware of the work that you are doing and are interested in working with you all to say, okay, let's look at how we do this over time now that we have this data? When we published our Violence Against Women study in 2013, it was followed up shortly thereafter by a, an event at the Union League Club. We had about two or 300 mostly women come. The Sun Times, head of the Sun Times News Group, who's long gone now, um, and a mid-level, the Tribune would only send a mid-level manager. They didn't want to send anyone, but the new, the, edit, the new editor had just become a member of the Union League Club, so they had to send someone. And he said flat out they wanted no part. They didn't think their coverage was bad, it was just the, the sources in the coverage. And I said, you're missing something, you're not realizing it's not who's involved, who you're sourcing in your 200, you know, 197 out of 205 stories on sexual assault that are about stranger rapes. It's the fact that you shouldn't be writing those stories, period. And uh, they didn't, they weren't interested. So they're going to become very interested when this goes live. And you can near real time prove that their reporting doesn't match the incidents. So what process does, CJ, does the CJP utilize the quality, I would say QC is quality control? They're finding sample checking or outside member reviewing. Um, right now we haven't done that. Whoever wrote that, can you be a little clearer about what you mean about? Yes. So for the initial report about the sexual assault cases, Yes. did you, did you check any of those numbers to make sure you guys did the coding right or the, the analysis? There was, there was no coding. That was all done by hand. Okay. And did you, did you go back and do a second, second sample or have some other look at some part of it to make sure that your numbers were... Yeah, I mean, they were very, the, the number of sexual assault reports were 205. He literally took them out of the scraper, read them all, printed them all. It was a human that did it. So there was very little human going. And the uh, numbers we compared them to were numbers out of the city's data portal. And other numbers I'd gotten through a FOIA from the state's attorney. But we, we will have quality control before this goes live. Um, is, are there any plans to... I assume the, the code is open source, and is the, will the data be open for anyone to be able to download and use as well? Yes, as soon as we're done building the front end we want, yes, it will be open. Oh, I'm sorry, let me back up, I'm sorry. It will be open, but all you're gonna get is the first line, the headline and the first line of the article. That's all I can communicate to anyone. I can't communicate the content of the article. It's a violation of copyright. So that's all you'll get from us. Unless you, I'm, we may go through, we, there might be a research process that we'd have to check with our lawyers and then you'd have, you wouldn't be, you'd have to promise not to show the article because we can't communicate the content of the article. So there might be for f other research purposes. We'd be open to that idea. What about the date? The date, the date, the title, the author, and one line is all we can give you. Any plans to um, compare, do the same thing you're doing with uh, published news uh, with social media to see what the, what the delta is like over there? At some point, yes. Um, the answer is at some point, yes. There are people that are working, there are researchers working on it, on social media content. <laughs> related to gang violence and, and things like that that I'd be interested in collaborating with. Um, but right now I'm very happy about where we're at and I'm looking forward to putting a front end on it and then I'll be very happy after a while to look at stage two. So I think this is for you, Kevin, the second question. So for burglary data, did, did you, will you adjust to residential property versus vacant versus vacant lots, owning, renting, 
Um, do you consider these? We won't have that data to, con to control for that. So right now, there's very li little, little um, data that we'll just get for the crime incidents. We just get it from the city's uh, CPD, you know, the data portal. So I would love to control for that. We just won't have it. We're suing in a few weeks to get more data, so maybe we will have that soon, but it'll probably be a year or two. Yeah, uh, so I wanted to give a little bit more extra context on that. Um, I don't know if any people here read the, the webcomic XKCD, but there's a good one which shows a map, and then it's you know a heat map like I showed, and then there's, it shows another one which is a completely different topic, and the conclusion is basically, you know, when is your heat map just the same as a population map, right? Because are you just showing, they're reporting where there are people? Um, and I think that's that's similar to what this this question is getting at is, you know, are you controlling for vacant lots versus open lots? Or, you know, or those are the same, but vacant lot versus not vacant lot. Um, controlling in all those different ways. I think to a certain extent, I would ask if we need to. Um, the main the main reason we may not need to there is because we have the the actual incident proportion, right? In the, in this neighborhood, four percent of all burglaries in the city of Chicago happen in this neighborhood right here. Um, that is in some ways already controlling for the population amount, and then we see that, oh, there's 5% of news articles in that neighborhood. Um, in a lot of ways that, you know, we're already normalizing by saying how many incidents are there. That's the, the kind of normalization factor we're comparing to. So I don't know if population is actually a necessary thing there. If, if you think otherwise, I'd be happy to talk after this. So I know there's like, uh, you showed Lakeview earlier, then there's that, uh, what is it called? Crime in Lakeview Boys Town blog or something? That's all day long, every crime, that guy writes a blog about it or something, right? So are, are there, uh, how many of those are like factored in? And is there any like chance in the future? I'm just trying to figure out how many eyeballs actually saw that article or? I don't know to be honest with you. Um, yeah, um, I, I have, I'm, I, as a criminologist, I'm really, really um, nervous about the impact of unfiltered, uncontextualized crime data and the ability of the public to um, interpret it correctly. And I think most of the time when you see that unfiltered just vomit of crime data, you're usually getting it from people who have an agenda and the agenda is to drive fear. There's all, we live in a city of 2.7 million people, crime is going to occur. So, and that people have a hard time when it's unfiltered determining the difference between crime occurring and their likelihood, that relation to a likelihood of being them, um, so. If you are successful in creating a sea change in how crime is reported in this city, what do you see as the long-term benefit of your work? I mean, maybe it's sort of vaguely obvious, but could you clarify that? How, how will mechanisms be improved by a more one-on-one a -on -one correlation of crime and crime reporting? Well, there wouldn't be a push from politicians in the media to hire a thousand more cops for Chicago. All right, that's a billion dollar investment over the next 20 years we made with not a, piece, a single piece of social science data to show it's gonna make any difference. So that would be one thing. But hopefully the idea is to get the public policy and get the reforms that are going targeted on the ones we most need to happen rather than the ones that are politically expedient to politicians, because that's what happens most of the time. And I'm gonna tell you, I've got a FOIA suit coming up, and I'm FOIAing their analysis they did for that thousand hire, and they don't have one. And I'm gonna get them on paper to admit it. That was a political decision. So hopefully, we will let people, like the Violence Against Women community and others, be able to gain some steam, because they'll be able to prioritize stuff that is most important to us. In my view, you want to stop street crime, you got to solve domestic crime first. You got to settle down what's going in the homes. So that's what I hope. That's my personal goal. So you've talked about uh, going live over answering the questions and you've hinted at it. Can you explain a little bit more by what you mean saying we're going live? Yeah, I would love, um, I would love a site that on, that's automated, obviously, that overlies the crime incident data and the crime reporting with crime incident data. We also have prosecution data. We also have calls for service data. Um, so there's, there's, we have the ability to add many layers. It's about building the front end and the data warehouses to handle it. So that's, 
that's the next step that CJP's got to figure out is taking the great work these guys have done and moving it forward. And I would also love, Josh, um, I would also love, and I may be doing this at IIT over the summer, but I would really love as a next stage if we can work on sentiment analysis a little bit. Because uh, I would love to know in the story whether or not the police and prosecutors and courts, as the, the stories were being reported on, are being portrayed neutrally, negatively, or positively. So I would, that would be a dream come true if that we could find a way to do that. Um, so I'm curious, this seems like a, you know, data intensive work and there's a lot of scrapping involved, right? So you, you are spending human hours. Have you guys looked into using like robotic process automation to like at least get a data pipeline of sorts to like automate a lot of the scrapping, saving you guys time in place of doing it manually? Uh, it is all automated. Oh yeah. yeah. So we're, yeah, we have uh, scrapers running. Uh, it's all open source. Mm -hmm. um, it's on GitHub, I think, linked from our issue, um, our breakout group issue. Um, so yeah, there, I think we're scraping 25 or 30 news sources around Chicago. Um, and then now at this point we have, we're immediately when we scrape a new article, we'll classify it and geotag it. After we're all, after this is ending, you guys break out, we're happy to show you the interface, the human coders, the human categorizers used to do that. I'm gonna take a question really quick from the doc about the hiring of a thousand more officers. They're hiring a thousand officers over and above the officers they're hiring to replace retirements. So it's not about replacing the retirements. Tracy, I've, I've heard you talk about this for a, a while, and so it's really uh, great to see what you're doing. Uh, I see a lot of the, uh, when you talk about going live, uh, bringing the data up to the website, but when I look at your maps, I see stories. Uh, will the website uh, make it easy for people to create uh, maps like your burglary examples that turn them into stories or advocacy? Ideally, ideally, yes. I would love that. Um, it, it, this has been going on. I started this in May. We went live scraping May 30th or 31st, 2011. So, you know. Hopefully that will be included in version one, but that might be version three. I'm a very patient man at this point. <laughs> but also very thankful to, I mean, a breakout group to last this long to do this kind of work is um, where CJP is incredibly lucky by the work that all, they've all put in. Plus Matt in the back is here. So this is no small two-day group. Do you guys have any plans on doing any news scraping on uh, news sites outside of Chicago that look into Chicago? We do the um, Daily Herald. We do, well, I'll just tell you what, we do all the television stations here in Chicago, 2579 Fox, Channel 11. We do all the radio stations, WHN, WBBM. We do uh, the Daily Herald. We do the Springfield State Journal Registry. Um, Chicago Reporter, The Reader. Um, a bunch of blogs, The Beachwood Reporter. Chicago now. I'll show you. I'll show you the list in a minute once we get done with this. All right. Thanks, guys. We appreciate it. Thank you.